not quite the same number of cars as the cutoff year. 65 cars heading out to race here at Silverstone. Well, to run through the grid is going to take forever. Let's just say at the sharp end, expect to see several Shelby American Cobra Daytonas, a number of V8 engine TVR Griffiths and a whole host of E-types. That gets us through about the first 10 rows of the grid. Also, let's pick out a few. The Lotus Elans, okay, 1600cc twin cam engine, comfortably outgunned by all the Cobras, the Daytonas and so on, but light, nimble and very quick. The Sunbeam Le Mans Targi, you won't have seen very many of those. They only ever built three. One of them is racing here and any field that has got this variety with a Marcos, with a Corvette Stingray, the C2 car that Sir Chris Hoyle will be driving. Look at the Ginetta G4s as well. Like the Elans, smaller engine, light, nimble, one of them right at the front end of the field. Then we get the more saloon car orientated cars, the GT350 Mustangs, the Austin Healy's. All right, not a saloon car, nor is a 911, but less of an outright racer. MGBs here as well. And any field that features a Reliance Sabre 6 is absolutely 100% pure gold. You've never heard of it. You probably have never seen one racing. You will hear today. Luke Wass is in his car, car number three. Great looking car from uh, Reliant. And there it goes through the shot. A sort of a little bit of an Aston Martin DB4 feel to it without offending too many Aston Martin fans, but uh, another great Reliant sports car. Martin Haven and Alistair Douglas. Alistair, we're going to have our work cut out for us, not just because there will be class battles all the way up and down the orders. All the Elans will be knocking spots off each other. All the Cobras and E-types and the Ginetta at the front of the field will be trying to do likewise. There's probably 20 potential winners here. Actually, probably about 40 potential podium finishers. So we've got to keep an eye on that. There's all the different class battles. It's a pit stop race. There's a whole different kettle of fish there because different cars of different engine capacities have to stop for different times. Better quality drivers spend longer in the pits and so on. So we're going to have to pick the bones out of that. But 65 60s GT cars, it's just a staggering grid. It is indeed, yes. And just quickly to say that some of the teams I notice have put the faster driver in first. Some have chosen to put the faster driver in second. We saw that Ilan, uh, the uh, faster driver, will go second. Yeah, uh, and it, it possibly depends where you are and where you hope to finish. But if you're at the sharp end, you might well want to put your fast driver in first. Ready to go racing here for the international trophy for pre-66 classic GT cars. 65 cars start to stream across the line. 50 minutes to go. There'll still be 49 minutes on the clock before the last of them even take the start. This is like the start of the London Marathon. There are so many of them already down into turn three and four. Some are still streaming across the line. Some probably still doing up their trainers at the back, but it is the pole sitting car of Julian Thomas, the Cobra Daytona that has been jumped at the start by John Davidson in the black TVR Griffith, the lighter, nimbler TVR with a short wheelbase. He's responding best to the tight first corner sequence here at Silverstone. But when we get on the straight, expect to see that big American iron. Here we go, down the long Wellington straight. Doesn't quite have enough to overhaul the TVR here, but he's got three bites to the chair. You've got the Wellington straight, you've got the Hamilton straight, four bites. You've got the national pit straight that they're coming up to now as well, the old pit straight, and you've also got the hangar straight. So the big front engine muscle cars with the American V8s. There you go, there's another one. Uh, another of the TVRs having a go at the Cobra. But the Cobra Daytonas, we can expect to be very quick in a straight line. Yes, and these first three cars all effectively got the same engine, the 4.7 litre Ford V8 engine. So uh, very, very similar performance from probably from the engines. Very different chassis, though. The two TVRs versus the Shelby Daytona Cobra. Not an original car, but a copy of the original. There were only six ever made. And uh, as they come through the wonderful Maggots uh, left-handed sweeper that goes into Beckett's, it's John Davison who leads in the TVR Griffith from uh, Julian Thomas in his uh, Shelby Daytona 
Daytona Cobra Coupe from the th uh, third car, which is Mike Whitaker's TVR Griffith, just kicking up the dust there. Uh, and he's being challenged by the first of the E-types, which uh, I think might be the Pearson car, is it? Uh, we'll see as they turn in to... No, we don't see as they turn into Stowe Corner, but the rest of this 61 car field coming down the hangar straight. Well, the big loser at the start was the Halstead and Eagling Janetta. It's a little pale yellow car that started fourth on the grid and has now dropped to about 10th place. So they got absolutely mugged by all the hyper horsepower. Now, they and the Alans, and to a degree the E-types as well, who are sort of outgunned by these big block Fords, We'll be looking to a little bit later in the race, perhaps after the driver change, when the big engine cars have outrun their tyres and their brakes and they're starting to fade, their braking distances get longer, and as a result, their pace drops. But look at this, battle for the lead on the inside comes the Cobra Daytona, Julian Thomas, who shares with Callum Lockie, as he does so often, has the outside line now, though, as they get to the loop, and John Davidson cuts back underneath him, but he runs out wide. Thomas knew what was going on there. It's a great bit of racing. He allowed the door to remain open on the inside, knew that the TVR driver would run out wide, and so he was focused on getting a great exit onto this straight, the straight where he knows he's got a slender advantage. He took the lead coming on, and that's a really good piece of thinking by Julian Thomas, and he is keeping uh, Callum Lockie, his powder dry, in the locker. Now, there's a uh, problem early on, 112, one of our Lotus and Lands, that's Gonzalo Gomez and James Claridge's car, the Lotus Elan 26R, the racing version of the road car. And that car at the side of the track didn't look like it had damage, though. And the uh, first of the E-types, uh, I suggested it might be the Pearson car. It's not actually, it's the Dodge car. The Pearsons were brothers, the Dodds father and son. Yes. Uh, so uh, it's the Dodge car that is in fourth place. Now, we were told that Graham, the father, would start the car and James would take over. Um, that's uh, what's come through on our information. So uh, let's assume it's Graham Dodd who is behind the wheel of the E-type. But he's very slightly lost touch with Mike Whitaker's TVR for the moment anyway as Julian Thomas leads through uh, a lovely slide there through Beckett's for Julian Thomas in the Shelby Daytona Coupe and then it's the first of the two TVR Griffiths for John Davison uh, and John Davison and Mike Whitaker know each other so well from club racing throughout the season they get these cars out they race against each other all around the country they know each other very well indeed and then it's the Dodds E-type and in fifth place is the white and blue E-type of 188 that's the, that started by the faster driver, that's uh, Chris Ward. Uh, with all due respect to Richard Kent, Chris is normally the quicker of the two, the two and uh, he's up first in this car. So that's interesting, uh, good strategy there from them, and he's got the car up into fifth place there as they is. go out of club corner. Yeah, white car with the blue roof, the lead E-type, the all-black car just in front, so that is the battle behind the big American iron. Of course, all these E-types were the classic XK engine that was developed by Jaguar for racing in the C and D types that won at Le Mans were so successful in period. Won't see any, I oh, do see a D type racing actually later this weekend, I think, and some C types as well. But with their slightly lighter, nimbler chassis, uh, although they weren't particularly successful internationally in period, they have become very finely tuned race machines since then. And a lot more development has gone into them since then, uh, before Jaguar moved on to other things. So the Daytona Cobra, Cobra coming down the straight, starting to build an advantage over the two TVRs in second place. And then Jaguar's fourth and fifth. Two TVRs aren't both in second place, battling for second place, second and third. Uh, Davison and Whitaker, the uh, dark blue car with the white stripe and the pale metallic blue of Mike Whitaker's car. And of course, for those who are trying to think why the back of a TVR Griffith that you might not have heard of looks familiar, those rear lights, yeah, straight off a Mark I Cortina, that uh, band the bomb style uh, triangular light uh, arrangement, very distinctive. And the TVR as well, short chassis, very twitchy. Now here's a Ginetta in trouble, that's a G4R, the uh, racing version of Ginetta's G4 road car, and that is the uh, Ron Maiden and Robin Ward car. I think Ron Maiden is driving solo in this race. Uh, oh, OK. Uh, well, late, late change. And uh, Ron Maiden is uh, the boss of Masters, which is uh, one of the organisations that's putting on a lot of our grids this weekend. Ah. And uh, the G4R, the, uh, the little Ginetta with the 
uh, Lotus twin cam engine, a very, very quick car. But uh, you've already said that the quickest of them, sadly, has faded at the beginning of the race. We were expecting that to be in amongst the leaders. Yeah, it's down to 13th place. Pale yellow car just about coming onto the hangar straight as the leaders turn into Stowe. So they didn't have the greatest start. They are going to be looking for a little bit more. Looking on your timing pile on there, 25th place, Marco Attard and some bloke called Hoy. Now, fairly well known for pedalling a bicycle. Uh, that is Sir Chris Hoy, the multiple Olympic champion. So uh, the GT race with Marco Attard, the former British GT champion, drifting out wide there, coming back on. Chris Ward, that's the sort of thing that loses touch with the car in front. We're just pushing a fraction harder than the car can really cope with. Now then, here's a, a David versus Goliath. Uh, Lotus Elan versus the Corvette Stingray, and that pale blue car is the car starting. If it's got a black helmet, it's Marco Attard. We were told he was starting, and Sir Chris Hoy will take over later. I think Sir Chris was enjoying, if that's the right word, the prospect of uh, trying to wrestle this thing around. It's a little a bit like uh, trying to wrestle a, a greased alligator, I think. It doesn't particularly want to play nice. As you can see, right in the middle with the uh, Lotus Elans, hovering around it and using all of that big Corvette muscle to thunder past on the straight. Of course, it also then has a distinct disinclination to go round corners or to slow down, so getting it up to speed is considerably easier than scrubbing that speed off. And I think you're right, it is Marco Attard, as we were told, uh, would be starting that car with a black helmet, uh, car number 30. It's uh, quite a different shape to uh, many of the cars around it. Uh, very American, isn't it, with that uh, uh, sweeping back on it. Rather similar to the Elan that it was battling with a moment ago. That's the, the shape craft Elan. As a, oh, another G4. Now that's, that, the, that's the Holstead and Eagling car yeah. that qualified in fourth place. It is going backwards, and that is now literally going back because they've just been passed or had just been passed for 13th place and that will cost them another three or four spots so that's they are really not having the race that i was hoping to see from them and i wonder whether they've got a little bit of an issue with that car because that car was very quick indeed in qualifying and i mean you can see how tiny it looks even compared to a lotus elan look the lotus elans are dwarfing it Oh, he was trying to dig himself out of trouble behind the turquoise E-type and just about got avoided there. The hairy canary, that bright yellow AC Cobra going through on the inside. That was a worrying moment. That car is looking very much more sideways, I think, than the Ginetta G4 would normally expect to be. That's got a lot of oversteer. I'm not sure that's an entirely healthy car, unfortunately, and they are way back down the order now. A couple of Cobras ahead of the Ginetta there, the yeah. uh, traditional shaped Cobra rather than the more aerodynamic uh, Coupe Cobra that's leading the race as the Ginetta makes its way through Stowe Corner, as you say, very much drifting around. That might be the way that it likes to be driven. Uh, but yeah. uh, we're certainly not seeing the performance from that car that the fourth place on the grid suggested we might. It, it seems to be an awful lot more under control in left-handers than in right-handers. Now, again, that might just be, of course, the circuit's clockwise, so, so there are more fast right-handers, but it just looks like a bit of a handful, and I wonder if they've got an issue. Now, here is our race leader already in traffic. The 911s in this race are all in the up to two-litre category. Of course, this is where Porsche were just starting with the 911 program, uh, with the likes of Vic Elford winning the Monte Carlo Rally in a 911. And of course, they were racing all over Europe and all over the world in circuit racing, in rallying, in hill climbs. And that's, you know, a story that continues to this day with the 911. All the shapes it's gone through, all the different sizes and power increases it's had. Still very much a driver's car that even the earliest of 911 drivers would recognize. They'd perhaps trust it a little more these days. Um, all sorts of changes going a little further down the top 20 as well. And uh, that reflecting, I think, the spin of the Halstead and Eagling car that's now down to 23rd place from fourth on the grid. And, and that, that is not driver pace. That is, that is a, an unhappy car. 
Another change I've noticed is that the number 14 TBR Griffith, another of the 4.7-litre engine cars, with uh, Hot Shoe Ollie Hancock at the wheel. So that's mm. another car where they've chosen the potentially faster driver to start the race. Ollie Hancock has got the number 14 TVR up into sixth place, having demoted the Pearson brothers down a place in their E-type. Uh, this is a car you don't miss, the turquoise <laughs> of uh, German Count Marcus von Oyenhausen, but uh, he's not driving the car. That, in fact, is Andy Newell at the wheel, and he'll be handing over to uh, Rea Sorter, the lady that prepares the car for the uh, Count, and uh, Andy Newell uh, very often shares and uh, usually goes first. Very, very flamboyant driver. We should see that car going nice and sideways. There we are, lovely drift through there. And a little bit more opposite lock to finish the corner off as he goes down into the Vale. Uh, and uh, the number 14 E-type, uh, sorry, the uh, E-type of uh, Newell and Sauter. The car number 152 is in 13th place. Yeah, as you say, very hard to miss. Uh, that is my new favorite E-type color. My favorite E-type color is primrose yellow, which is a sort of pale, uh, yellow, which I think just suits the organic shape of the car so well as a road car. I think that is now my new favourite colour. Still on German road plates. So as with many of these cars, it's still got lights and indicators and everything else um, capable of being driven to a racetrack, put through their paces and brought back. And through he goes. That's another place made up. And that's passing the James Thorpe E-Type, yeah. number 34. And in fact, that's about to lose another place as well to the car right behind. Uh, did that happen or is it about to happen? James Thorpe sharing with Phil Quaith. And... Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's normal, Andy Newell. That was all a bit sixes and sevens there coming into Brooklyn. <laughs> Car. Not entirely sure it wanted to stop quite that late, was it? You see, some of these cars are running with a fabric hood. Most of them are running with a hard top erected because uh, it's better for aerodynamics and also allows you to put things like cooling vents in. You can see on the back of the hard top there and also one on the rear deck of the car. That's a lovely E-type battle, this, isn't it? We're yeah. watching. Uh, this is uh, car number 152. We've spoken about Andy Newell, 12th place. He's battling with uh, Jonathan Mitchell, number 57, and the uh, Thorpe and Quaife E-type, number 34, as well as they blast through maggots into the Beckett's complex. Now, we should see three E-types going sideways here. Firstly, Andy Newell, lovely, drifting through, and then behind the second of the E-types, also drifting its way behind him. And uh, wonderful sight as they come out through Chapel Curve. And now the long shot up the hangar straight. And uh, we can see those three E-types fanning out. Now, that turquoise car came from 22nd on the grid. The car behind it came from 9th on the grid. So there's been quite some progress from Andy Newell. And here is car number 100, and this is Louis Bracey in his Jaguar E-Type, 1965 car. And again, with the 2 plus 2 bodywork with that side opening uh, rear window. If you want an E-Type to be practical as an everyday driver, and they are practical as an everyday driver, that's the one you want. Yeah. A nice gunmetal grey, yeah. That's it's going to be a beautiful commuter. It's even got a kind of a hatchback idea yep. because the, the rear door, it's not just a window, there's yep. door opens and you can put your bags in and uh, go away. Oh, oh, and Louis Bracey spins. Well, try not to do that when you're commuting to work on the M40, but yes, it just goes, just goes to show that the car, uh, these all these cars are being driven right on the fine edge of balance. So Chris Hoy putting on his helmet something he's been doing almost all his life. Cycling helmets tended to be a little bit different. Multiple Olympic champion Chris Hoy also raced in the British GT Championship for a couple of seasons and uh, enjoying his racing very much these days wherever he can. Great uh, proponent and uh, supporter of British cycling and all sorts of different cycling the world over. And uh, no harm done then for Louis Bracey in the number 100 E-Type. Uh, a big spin, but no contact with anything. And there doesn't seem to be any issue with the car, which is good news. Yeah. As we look at, uh, in the background there, this very quick Ginetta, which uh, has 
flattered to deceive, unfortunately. It's, uh, it was very, very quick, but again, very unstable under braking there. So uh, you may be right there, Martin. It might have some sort of a, a suspension issue. It is just losing places. I mean, Marco Attard is coming up behind it. Marco Attard is two cars behind that. Uh, the Halstead and Eagling Ginetta started in fourth on the grid, and the Corvette Stingray started in 33rd. So they, this, with all due respect, this is not Marco making up 30 places off the grid. It is definitely a sign that the Ginetta is not punching its weight, is it? For whatever reason, it does look like a whole lot more of a handful than it probably ought to. Just ahead of Marco Attard in that Corvette actually is Greg Audi in his AC Cobra. And uh, our first look properly at uh, an Austin Healey 3000, uh, not in the red and white colours, but green and white, another colour that was very popular in period. And uh, the Austin Healey 3000, the three-litre six-cylinder engine in the front of that, uh, very, very successful in racing and in rallying as well, particularly driven by Sterling Moss's sister, Pat Moss Carlson, yeah. in uh, Alpine rallies of the period. Yeah, a real a tiny car with a huge engine, the Austin Healey 3000. Um, particularly uh, after the 104, which is a four-cylinder engine, the big six-cylinder engine really brought it back to the front in uh, rallying competition. But uh, Pat Moss always said just what an absolute beast the car was to drive. Very physical device, very, very hot indeed. If you look at the side of the Austin Healey, essentially where normally you'd have the lower part of a door and a sill, uh, they have an exhaust um, because there was no room to run it under the car, so it was... You had a furnace in front and the heating pipes running along the side of the car. A very hot environment indeed. And good battles going on around this Austin Healey, particularly mm. I think John Pearson there, number 53 in the grey E-type, losing a place to the Elan. Uh, that will be, that's Andrew Haddon in the Elan, number 16, just ahead of him. So that moves Haddon up to ninth and Pearson down to 10th. And uh, John will hand over to his brother Gary. We're here, we just saw the uh, the E-type battle with the turquoise car that we were watching, uh, sandwiching a car at 9-11 between them. Here's another of our Lotus Elan 26 Rs. It's car number 10, Simon Butler, Martin Rich's car. Martin Rich, I don't think, is driving. We had a late change to... Right, OK, uh, well, so. I put a question mark by him, but uh, Simon Butler, the racing reverend, uh, a, an Anglican minister who uh, really enjoys his racing. You may have seen him already in uh, the Le Mans series because he's certainly yep. looking towards racing at Le Mans. Yep, uh, he was uh, a, a guest of ours at uh, Goodwood a few weeks ago. Very entertaining chats as well. And, uh, yeah, as you say, not just racing historics. is where he cut his teeth racing in historics, but uh, is racing in the Le Mans series and looking to go and race in the 24 hours. 24 hours of Le Mans, of course, uh, all sorts of echoes of that in some of our sports car races and our Group C demonstration, which comes up not too uh, short, not too far away from now. Of course, 2023 is the centenary Le Mans 24 hours. If it's always been on your bucket list to go to Le Mans, I suggest you do it absolutely any year you can. But if you're ever going to go, for the 100th anniversary of the world's greatest endurance motor race, next year is the time Talk your family into it, talk your friends into it, talk somebody into it, or go alone. It really doesn't matter. You won't be alone for long. You'll be in a field with 350,000 similarly passionate idiots. Now then, we are fast approaching pit stop time in this 50 minute race. So let's have a little think about that as we watch this Alain battle continue, Alistair, because this is really where the team actually plays a big part in it because they have to get the strategy right. You're going to lose so much more with a penalty if you get your pit stop wrong than you will ever make up by being a little bit short in the time that you're stationary. That's right, yes, it's very important. Uh, and I suppose most teams might say, well, it's, every second is important, but it's better to be a second over than a second under uh, because they will be penalised and then it's a drive through or whatever the regulations say. Uh, the pit stops for this race, uh, the pit window is now open, so we should see drivers start. In fact, we are seeing uh, the lower order starting to come in, uh, but 60 seconds 
second stationary for the smaller engine cars up to four litres and 68.3, don't ask me why, 68.3 <laughs> for the over four litres. And then just to throw another thing into the mix, and I don't propose to tell you who they all are, but there are a number of drivers who will be have an extra eight and a half seconds to stop and one car with 17 extra seconds. And that's the one driven by Guy Zeiser and Ollie Webb because Ollie is a, a, an elite driver. So, and they're in a Porsche 911, so that's in the under, that's a smaller capacity, so their normal pit stop will only be 60 seconds, so their stop will be 77, but if they were in a big engine car, it would be uh, 80. 2.3 plus plus the 17 so it will be right. yeah i mean you no know, time to go out and make a cup of tea oh cup of tea nice idea here's our race leader now the big engine cars will have that longer pit stop and again that's all part of the way that this race will ebb and flow and of course that's to reflect the fact that in a long distance race the 12 hours of sebring 24 hours of daytona 24 hours of le mans even a six or eight hour race let's say or even a four hour race the bigger cars would guzzle more fuel and would have to stop more often than the smaller cars and as a result would spend more time stationary so in this one hour race 50 minute race which is sort of a microcosm of the world in which they plied their trade they also have to spend more time stationary here it's artificial they don't refuel they don't need to refuel at least let's hope they don't need to refuel because there's no option for that but it does reflect the fact that in long distance racing the bigger thirstier more powerful cars would spend more time stationary than the lighter more economical and slightly slower cars so that's the way that the rules have been framed again you can see the battles continuing marco attard in the stingray this is a c2 generation corvette again i'm not quite sure when this c nomenclature came in the first was a corvette and then the second was a Corvette Stingray, and then became a Stingray. It was, uh, it was a, a Mako Shark was the name of the open show car that led directly to the shape of this second generation Corvette. And of course, it was also the uh, Corvette Grand Sport Racer that developed from that, that uh, raced successfully in the very early 60s, an open car with sort of a bubble cockpit almost, or a, a sort of Batmobile cockpit. And the uh, the, the Corvette Grand Sport that this racer developed from the Corvette Coupe, the C2 Coupe, still with the big block Corvette motor out front. And again, another Austin Healey in the more traditional uh, BMC works colours, tartan red with the old English white roof. And coming into the pit lane for uh, a driver change. Now, whether you're driving with a driver, uh, a co-driver or not, the pit stop time remains the same. And of course, unlike the early cars, the pre-war cars that didn't have seat belts or hands devices or doors or roofs or anything else, um, it is a longer stop. It's not just 15 seconds because you can't leap in and out and do the seat belts up in that time. So it will be a minimum for everybody of 60 seconds. And that is really for safety to make sure that driver's seat belts are properly fixed and everybody is safe before they leave the pits. And Ron Maiden and Robin Ward's Giannetta having uh, faced the wrong way briefly, still continuing. In the uh, background, we've got the leaders starting to come into the pits now. It's uh, uh, two of them are solo drivers, so it really doesn't matter when they stop. But uh, the Dodds also in in their E-type. So some of the leading cars now starting to do their mandatory stops. Yeah, and uh, cars that perhaps have been bottled up behind somebody, as the Dodds have behind the Whitaker TVR, uh, they were only eight tenths of a second behind, so probably felt that they either A, could have gone quicker, or B, were starting to overheat in the turbulent air behind the car in front. Uh, now, there you go. We were, we were seeing with the Nissan Skylines and their turbocharged engines, uh, the leaf blowers blowing cold air through the radiators. Here it's to cool the brakes on the car. This is the TVR, uh, the uh, dark TVR 88 of John Davison, the man who started the race in second place. He came into the pits from third. Mike Whitaker's in as well. The Dodds are in, so third, fourth and fifth. Uh, came into the pit lane. Uh, neither of these drivers have uh, additional time to serve. They just do the standard 68.3 second yeah. stop for the over four litre cars. And away goes the 88, a car that took the lead at the start, didn't it? So here is Sir Chris Hoy. Well, a sort of whole different dynamic for Chris Hoy, really, isn't it? Sports car racing, because 
Not sure he's ever shared his bicycle with anybody in a race. That's definitely not the way that I recall the Kirin or any of the other Olympic races being run. But here he is. Marco Attard comes to a halt in the Corvette. And the team helpers will go in. They're not fixing anything in the car. What they're doing is getting ready to fix the belts for the driver. And if you think, well, that's just, you know, molly coddling them, you have not sat in a competition seat with a hands device and a helmet on. The belts have to be done up so tight that you literally cannot breathe in fully. Otherwise, you'd just be slopping around in the car. Even in a car like this, the G-forces in the corners will be throwing you around. There's Marco shouting a bit of advice. The brakes are gone, mate, and all that sort of thing that you probably find in a big engine car like this. But uh, the, the seatbelt helpers really are necessary to make sure the driver can do the belts up and to make them as tight as possible. But you can see there the stopwatch. Of course, it's an iPhone. Of course, it is uh, being shown to Chris. He's getting the countdown. And then probably like the start of a rally stage, five fingers, four, three. You can also see the man on the driver's side of the car. So Chris is watching the clock. But he's also got to watch the hand to see when he can be released. So you think you just come into the pits, get in the car and drive off? No, there's a whole lot more to it. Unsafe release exists outside Formula One, you know. You don't want to be released into the path of something coming in and have your door stoved in. So Chris Hoy heads off out of the pit lane. That was a great view of how these pit stops happen. And uh, also happening at the same time, the two leaders have come in. Uh, Julian Thomas to hand over to Callum Lockie. And in the number 14, uh, TVR Griffith, Ollie Hancock will be handing over to the owner, John Spears. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, are we looking at that here? Yes, we are. So uh, this is the handover to John Spears. Now, don't worry too much about the liquid at the back of the car. The, the car's starting to overheat because it's stationed, just chunking a bit out of the system. Here's the MGB in the race. Of course, this will be Ed Foster's favourite car. If you don't know why, it's because Ed Foster has been racing an MGB over the last few years when he was at uh, Motorsport. And, and since then, and uh, also has uh, some big American behemoth, I remember not which type, but an Dan Gurney card that he bought a few years ago, uh, which he races. Guy Sizer and Ollie Webbs, Porsche 911. So this is the driver lineup that has the longest extra time to serve above and beyond their 60 seconds in the pit lane. Now, we're not going to time it for you, but suffice to say that if they were in a close battle with somebody, by the time they come back out, the battle will be, let's say, a little less close. Well, 17 extra seconds less close. Well, certainly a battle that uh, has remained close. Neither of the cars... Uh, needing an extra length stop because they're both solo driven anyway and that's the 88 TVR Griffith of John Davison and look who's behind him the same driver that's been behind him since the lights went out the Mike Whitaker 46 TVR Griffith so their pit stops were identical times they've come out together on the track and uh, they're going through the loop out onto the Wellington straight now there's uh, plenty of cars out on track so it's pretty much constant lapping for the faster cars now and they both uh, choose to go to the left hand side of the track and then cut back in ahead of that orange Elan number 10 uh, that's the racing reverend Simon Butler and then turning into Brooklands and through towards Luffield for uh, to start on to Woodcut Corner and then down to Cops Corner they'll go and all the way they're catching cars up having to look for ways past uh, and in fact the car ahead of them is the 14 John Spears car now started by Ollie Hancock yeah so that car and the uh, Julian Thomas Callum Lockie car have gone for opposite ways around where Ollie Hancock the pro driver if you like in the pro-am lineup started that car but Julian Thomas the am driver the owner uh, compared to Callum Lockie started their car so they have got their quicker driver in second uh, so there's could be some very interesting battles here there could be some big changes in the order so yeah a little queue of cars here working their way together through the Beckett's S's and I was looking uh, before the pit stop started, uh, Julian Thomas would have had to have stopped to hand over to Callum Lockie for an extra eight and a half seconds, but his lead was 13 seconds. So uh, when the pit stops finally unwind on our uh, timing screens and, and on your screen, uh, we will be able to see whether he's managed to hold on to the lead. Yeah, whether that five seconds has shrunk or grown. Now, just about everybody has stopped. The Warden Kent E-Type is out front. It has yet to stop. In the pits is 55, and that is Martin Melling and Jason Minshaw's Jaguar E-Type. That's a beautiful, that's that midnight blue. That's a very distinctive color. 
And that's Jason Minshaw, yeah. who's just hopped out, uh, just having a very welcome drink of water. Yeah, definitely. It's, a, it's hot business. I mean, what a beautiful weekend it's been. It's a fairly grim week in the UK. If you're not in the UK and you were watching from abroad, it has been a pretty dull week. It's been drizzly most of the week. Uh, in fact, Thursday, practice day, was very wet here at Silverstone. All the practice was run in the rain. And then qualifying day was nice and dry. And uh, race day today, it's absolutely gorgeous. Heading off is car number 72, Richard Cook's Shelby American Cobra. Again, I think it sort of depends on where it came from, whether it's an AC Cobra or a Shelby American. It was Carroll Shelby's Shelby American team that, that designed or engineered the Ford V8 into the Cobra in the first place. Originally, I think a 206, then the 289, and into the pit lane comes 188. This is our race leader, the Ward and Kent E-Type. So Chris Ward bringing the car in to hand over to the uh, car owner, Richard Kent. Uh, this uh, will be a longer stop because Chris Ward is an elite driver. So uh, they will drop down the order by an extra eight and a half seconds. And the... Minshaw and Melling car also in the pit lane. That was up near the top of the timing screens as well. But of course, we need to take into account the cars that haven't yet pit stopped. Well, these guys coming in within two and a half minutes or so, maybe three minutes of the pit window closing. They didn't want to push it right to the limit. But what they've had to do is because Chris Ward earns them more time stationary, they want him to earn more time or more, more pace on the track and keep him in as long as possible. So that was the obvious way to do that, uh, rather than run the short stint first and then put him in for longer later. They put him in to try and get the car as far up the order as they could before the stop. And they've done so because they stopped pretty much last of everybody. They were the leaders as they came in. Now, what will be telling is where they come back out once everybody has completed uh, their outlaps and it's all shuffled around. Uh, the fastest lap of the race so far uh, is has been set by this car in the hands of Julian Thomas. So let's write down 2 minutes 22.444. I'm not putting pressure on Callum Lockie. He's too much of an old friend for me to do that. But I'm putting pressure on Callum Lockie, whether he's an old friend or not. 2 minutes 22.444. That's the best lap of the car in the hands of Julian Thomas. Now, fresh brakes, fresh tyres, but a bigger fuel load. Let's see what transpires towards the end of the race as almost all the full fuel burns off and Callum Lockie really has got the bit between his teeth. The first lap out of the pits, he'll be getting settled and, and sort of getting himself fairly back into the car because he and Julian are driving something in just about every race here. So it takes a, a moment or two even for a driver of his calibre to really get himself back up to speed. But I sense that there might be new faster laps coming here. First flying lap, a 224.589. So has the car got more pace? He's up behind one of the GT350 Mustangs. Again, in very familiar uh, Shelby colours, white with the twin blue stripes. And down the hangar straight, uh, that car is, uh, as near as makes no difference, doing 150 miles an hour. Just under 149, actually, on the exact timing of uh, TSL, but uh, 150 miles an hour down the hangar straight. And uh, it's now coming up. Is that uh, on the same lap as the... Yes, it is. So uh, we're starting to see the pit stops unwind now, Martin. Well, to put that into perspective, a modern touring car of the British touring car style would probably be doing just a fraction more with 60 more years development. Yes, admittedly, with much less in terms of engine capacity, but perhaps a little bit more efficiency and good aero. Uh, what they don't have necessarily is the top speed. These cars, there's the uh, Tiger facing the wrong way, the Tiger Le Mans. Sunbeam Tiger Le Mans. The front bit up to the windscreen looks like a Sunbeam Alpine, Sunbeam Tiger. From the windscreen back, looks like it's a Shelby Daytona Cobra, and that perhaps is no surprise. It was designed to race at Le Mans, much more laid back windscreen than the original Sunbeam Alpine, as driven by James Bond and Dr. No and many others in the early 60s. 
That, that car with a long, sloping rear coupe body, just like the Shelby Daytona co coupe there. But this car, like the TVR, very short wheelbase, big V8, lots of power, and just occasionally a bit more than the driver can handle. And again, for the second spin there, the uh, first car on the scene was the Hairy Canary, that bright yellow Bahamian, originally Bahamian-based Cobra. And uh, that's dodging the bullet for the second time. So slightly chastened, there is the Hairy Canary. Uh, slightly chastened, the, uh, the Alpine returns to the track, or the Tiger Le Mans Coupe returns to the track. Nice little bubble on the roof there, mm. uh, known on the GT40 as the Gurney bubble, I think, as uh, Dan Gurney, uh, quite a tall driver, but uh, we see it there on the Cobra as well. Uh, makes it slightly more comfortable for the taller drivers. Yeah, a lot of these cars, very low indeed. The GT40, of course, was uh, perhaps the the, uh, the zenith of that, or the apogee of car height. And, uh, just a little bit more room for the driver. And they've incorporated into that also a cooling duct. So it actually draws air over the driver's helmet, which is possibly no bad thing. Now then, everything seems to have settled down. So where on earth are we? What on earth has gone on? It's, it's well, all changed at the front of the field. Oh, as the Hairy Canary has a looping spin to draw our attention away from trying to figure out who's where. Well, one thing that has changed on our timing screen, which I did suspect, is that the Dodds decided just to have James driving. Uh, it's gone to, from Dodd, Dodd, it's gone to Dodd now. Uh, that's very often the case. Graham Father sometimes chooses not to race, and the car was very, very quick in the opening stint when Graham was supposed to be at the wheel, but it's James solo I would put forward on that one, and it's leading at the moment, car number 21. Right. Uh, and in second place is the Davison Griffith, a TVR Griffith, John Davison, number 88. And in third place is the second TVR Griffith that has been locked to the rear bumper of the 88 car. That's the 46 Mike Whitaker TVR Griffith. Right, we've just seen a change of place because 192 there, Callum Lockie in that uh, dark blue, black is it, with the V white on the nose, the Daytona Coupe has just moved ahead of the number 14 TVR, the Hancock and Spears car. You can see that in the background there, the dark car with the stripe uh, straight up the nose and over the bonnet. So that is a change for, I've lost it on the screen, fourth place now. So the big Daytona Coupe that started the race spent another, what did we say, it was 12, uh, 13 seconds stationary? Eight, eight and a half uh, for that one. Okay, eight and a half seconds stationary. Um, so it has lost its lead, and as you said, yeah, we've got uh, car number 21 in the lead, which is the lead Jaguar E-Type, dark blue car, and then the two TBRs, the black car and the pale blue car, in that order, 88 and 46, giving chase. But the lead three are covered by under four seconds, and here they are. And look, here comes Callum Lockie, car 192. In front of him, you can see Mike Whitaker. Callum taking a very early line there into the left-hander. And Mike Whitaker right in front. So Lockie is gobbling them up. OK, what was his last lap? 224.8. And the cars in front of him are doing 28s, 26s and 27s. So the Daytona Coupe is the fastest car on track right now by between two and three seconds lap. There's the E-Type that leads. There's the TVR that's second. There's the TVR that's third. There's the Daytona that leads. Top left of your screen. There's the 10 minutes remaining. This is going to be, and this is the first time of the day, a real Silverstone-type finish. Absolutely it is, and that's often the way with these two-driver pit-stop races, long races. It's the 50 minutes. They often do an hour or an hour and a half in these cars, but 50-minute race on this programme, and he's coming... Uh, uh, Julie, Callum Lockie coming right up yeah. behind Mike Whitaker now. He gets the overlap, but doesn't quite get through as they go into chapel now down the hangar straight and we can see all the leading four cars in one shot here as they come down towards us passing the little red Elan <laughs> who uh, sensibly stays out of the way and <laughs> lets them thunder by 
and into Stoke Corner. A change of position if Callum Lockie can hold that position on the inside of Mike Whitaker. Mike Whitaker will try to come back at him as they go down into the Vale and into the left-hander at Club Corner, uh, that which leads into the much tighter right. But Callum Lockie's got that one sorted. So that is a move up into third place for Callum Lockie in the 192 Shelby Daytona Cobra. And now he's looking forward to the number 88 John Davison TVR Griffith. Yeah, Callum's coming in hot, isn't he? He is fully determined to win this race. It was a great first stint from Julian Thomas, the car's owner, and they only dropped back from the lead because they spent longer in the pit lane than some of their rivals. And Callum, in his day, a very competitive British GT race, and never quite got the brakes, I felt, in his uh, modern racing career but uh, in the historic cars. I mean, just look at the fluid way that he's driving this huge uh, Cobra Daytona Coupe around. It just makes it look like it's so willing. Probably guarantee if you were in the passenger seat, you would figure just how much work he's having to do. And again, look, looking deep down the inside here, a very, very different line, and it shouldn't really work. But it does, he's making it work for him, just out very wide there at Brooklands, of course. I talked him up and then he just about outbraked himself, but now he is passing one of the other E-types, not the leader, but he still stays in front of Mike Whitaker. More problems in the Elan camp, that's 150, was that? 135. 135, okay, so that's uh, the Reynolds and Quintero 26R. So uh, Callum Lockie continues, but he's at no means, uh, no, by no means certain that he will be able to get the lead back on this. We've only got seven and three quarter minutes left. Yep. He's very close, but uh, it's taking him a while to close up and then get past, isn't it? Uh, he's trying hard to get past that oh. as you get your Reliance Sabre now 6 get in the picture Reliance there. Sabre 6 in there, get the Sabre 6 because it had a six cylinder engine. And, and he's uh, right up behind the yeah. 88 uh, John Davison Griffith now, so he'll really be focusing on where he's got an opportunity to get by. And um, they're reeling in the leader in the E-Type as well, so it are. is all closing up. Look at that. The leaders, the top three, come by a couple of seconds, and Lockie's still about two seconds a lap faster than the cars in front of him, despite the fact that he's battling his way through traffic and past his rivals. He's all over the back of the black TVR of John Davison, Trying to find a way through, can't manage it there. Somebody just shot off into the pit lane in the background. That need not detain us now. Here is the battle for victory. Three cars in it right now. Coming up the Hamilton straight towards the fast right and left. Now, will the leader be delayed by the uh, Le Mans Tiger just ahead? The one we saw have a spin earlier on, uh, Chris Baton. But uh, no, I don't think it does. I think he'll get through on the run up to Village. But uh, oh, Lockie looking to go through late yeah. on the brakes up the inside. So Callum Lockie has got second place away from John Davison. Going up now towards the left-hander. Davison hasn't given up. He's going wide in. He'll come tight out. Uh, but I don't think he's going to get back past Callum Lockie. So uh, it's the it's uh, Jaguar leading. It's the Shelby Daytona Cobra in second place and the TVR Griffith in third. And a couple of interesting multi-car battles in front of our lead, well, quartet. You can, although Mike Whitaker's dropped away from this, the lead trio now, all three dark cars. So the, the E-type hanging on here inside the final six minutes but you really feel that time is running out for the leader the uh, graham and james dodd car now with a single driver and here comes callum Lockie. he's looking for the lead he's got the inside run through luffield now where do the back markers go who's going to benefit from this callum is determined to go inside he's got the lead he's in front goes by the e-type goes by the elan puts two more cars between himself and the E-Type, and Callum Lockie leads again in the Cobra Daytona Coupe. That was a big drive back after the pit stop from Callum Lockie. He is still lapping again quicker than his rivals. That was his, I think, his slowest lap in the car, two minutes 27, but he did pass half a dozen cars and take the lead in that lap. So uh, he is absolutely on fire. And an absolute joy to watch Callum Lockie there. The way he scythed through those back markers going into Cops Corner. So determined was he to go through, but he didn't uh, push anyone, he didn't shove anyone. He just took the line and he could see it. He was uh, absolutely 
in the right position at the right time, took the lead and uh, was able to actually take a few car lengths off uh, James Dodd, who got a little bit bottled up behind, but is now coming back at uh, Callum Lockie as, the, as he gets held up by an Elan. Elan can't jump out of the way, it's not his fault. Uh, so uh, they go through and uh, out onto another lap, and uh, that's helped James Dodd, who's now come up behind Callum Lockie as they come into Abbey and Farm. Throws the car a little bit sideways in the E type, but uh, about what four or five car lengths between them. So oh, an opportunity God. perhaps into village now. Maybe maybe a couple of smart car lengths between them, very little at all in it. James Dodd, as you say, has absolutely not given this one up. And the E type right now, as the race continues to its conclusion, may be starting to feel a little less loose and baggy than the Daytona Coupe. What that traffic did do is it dropped John Davison away from this group, but a little further into the clutches. No, it hasn't. Mike Whitaker's actually dropped even further back. There's more traffic behind. There is the black TVR with the white double stripes up its bonnet in third place in the background of the shot. But he has dropped away a fraction from these guys. James Dodd in second, and with the white V across the nose, the Julian Thomas Callum Lockie Daytona Coupe. Well, these things sound so fabulous trackside the big capacity ford v8s making the air thunder as they come past coming up behind sir chris hoy in his corvette and behind one of our austin healy's is the race leader and uh, a good moment to mention a few laps ago now but chris hoy has actually set the fastest lap in that car so quicker than marco attard who's uh, an ex as chris, sir chris hoy is an ex-british gt driver so uh, good on chris hoy has really got the uh, the measure of the big Corvette, which is about to be lapped by Callum Lockie. Yep, and uh, Marco Attard, a former British GT champion as well, so uh, no mean feat to be at least as quick as Marco in the car. May not be one of the best-known GT racing names internationally, but he has got an awful lot of experience under his belt. So Chris Hoy will stay out on the racing line. That's always what a, a quicker driver would hope for, for from a car he's coming up behind. If you stay on the racing line, they know where you're going. If you venture off it, then nobody's got a clue. Right behind is the 91 Austin Healy of Mark Holm. So two very different front engine GT concepts. The Austin Healy we always think of as quite a big car, not when you park it next to a Corvette Stingray, it's not. And on to the final lap now as they come across the line. One minute 40 to go, they're lapping in two minutes 20, so this is the last lap of the race for race eight here at Silverstone, the international trophy for classic GT cars. And again, all problems for the 84 E-Type. It's Rick Wilmot. Looks like that car has had a big lurid spin. He's got the door open, uh, so it looks like he doesn't have the capacity to move. But it is the final lap, so we should not finish under safety car, but the yellow flags will be flying at the final corner, which means that if James Dodd is going to do anything, he needs to do it in a big hurry. He needs to be ahead of Callum Lockie coming out of Stowe, just in case. I think that spin was on the exit of the club corner. We will wait and see. Here is the race leader, car number 192, as sideways as ever in the slow stuff. Far too much horsepower to, for the rear tyres to be able to control when they're new, never mind when they've been raced hard for the better part of an hour. Coming up behind another of our Shelby American Cobras, the uh, older brother, if you like, of the Daytona Coupe. And you can see why the AC Cobra was successful because it was brutal, but it was not aerodynamic. At top speed, it really lost out. And that's what the Daytona Coupe solved. At least that's what it was designed to solve. With all the power and speed, uh, it was at the Beckett's S's, in fact, that we had the spinner. With all the power and speed of the Cobra, with the big block engine in front, but a little bit better through the air. It's still a fabulous looking device. Lockie playing beautiful tunes on the pedals and on the steering wheel, just drifting out at the chapel curve the final time down the hangar straight. He can't take his eye off the ball, though. James Dodd is so close in the E-type that any mistake here in traffic, a half spin for Callum Lockie on the last lap would be disaster. The E-type would snatch it, but he's too experienced, I think. Too good a campaigner, Callum Lockie. 
Not for nothing does he have such a great CV in racing historic cars of all different types and vintages. And the chequered flag awaits at the end of this 50-minute encounter. The car that started on pole position was not to disappoint us. Julian Thomas and Callum Lockie claim victory. James Dodd second in the E-Type and TVRs finish in third and fourth for the glory of Blackpool. It is third place for John Davison and Mike Whitaker in the metallic blue car in fourth position. So many class battles going on that it's impossible to cover them all. But there was our victorious car, started by its owner, Julian Thomas, and Callum Lockie doing the second, or third, third of the race, the final part of the race, to bring the car home to victory. Well, that was really started, wasn't it, as so often is the case uh, by the owner-driver, Julian Thomas. If he'd gone backwards from pole position, then Callum's job would have been an awful lot harder. And he not only held, but built a lead over the rest of the field. Bearing in mind the talent and the engineering ability and the speed of the cars that are around him on this enormous grid, that is no easy task. So Callum Lockie will say, well, Julian did the hard work. All I had to do was not drop the ball but he did have to come from behind after their longer pit stop, and uh, through he did. Made some good passes as well there to take the lead. And he wasn't left with the longest time in the race either, so it's not like he had two-thirds of the race to make his passes. And uh, the slightly disappointing tail of the Janetta that started in fourth place. I'm sure we will find out eventually what happened to that G4. But the Halstead and Eagling car, car number eight, uh, finishing way down the order. In the end, it recovered a little bit of its composure to 13th place. I wonder if they made uh, a slight adjustment or changed something in the pit lane. Made two pit stops as well, so uh, there was obviously some issue with that car. It just, it just didn't look happy. There's, there's, you know, I'm, I'm not a driver. I don't have the eye that they have to try and spot why, but it just looked like more of a handful than I really expected from, from a Ginetta. There's another, well, there's the factory colors uh, of the uh, Daytona Coupe. Shelby American colors, the uh, bright blue and white stripes. That uh, 27 car built by Jordan. Uh, race team, which is uh, Mike Jordan, father, and Andy Jordan's son. Andy, of course, the 2013 British Touring Car Champion, now uh, runs the workshop of the Jordan Racing Team, and they built that car for Roy Alderslade, and that's had success in this uh, this type of race in the last couple of years. Well, I don't think we're seeing Michael or Andy Jordan racing here this weekend, which is a bit of a rarity in a big historic meeting, isn't it? It is, but I think it's like a lot of the other teams. They're so busy running yes. cars that uh, <laughs> they haven't got time to drive themselves because they're, they're, it's not like they sort of sit there on a director's canvas chair and tell everybody what to do. They're in there doing the work. Yep. And with Mike Jordan, like Martin Short, was ever thus, they're very much engineers who race or racers who engineer or I'm not quite sure where where they would each say the balance is but both of them very very uh, informed in the way their cars run and both very very competitive team owners car engineers and race drivers and of course Martin Short's sons are now uh, fast coming on as well as they start their junior racing career. Can't wait to see where the second generation of that goes. We know exactly how well Andy Jordan progressed from junior rally cross through into touring cars and then to become the British touring car champion. As you say, uh, the Jordan uh, workshops, not only uh, a whole host of their own cars, but so many built for others. In A40s, Lotus Cortinas, and uh, a whole host of others. So, as always, great chat after the races between the drivers. What happened to you? How come you were there? Where was that? Because everybody sees their own race, and you see very little of anybody else's. And so often you need to be, what happened to them? Where, where did they go? What happened to the Ginetta? Who knows? Nobody knows. And they will all find out later.
Well, it's been a beautiful day for spectating. Hope everybody slip, slop, slapped before they came out. I'm sure uh, all our marshals on their posts have been very, very grateful for uh, any liquid uh, that they brought and that, that was supplied. Uh, car number 16, Andrew Haddon. And here's Lotus Elan. Now, is he the Class C3 winner? Uh, yes, I think he is. Yes, he is. Uh, CLP winner, in fact, he is. So lots and lots of different class winners. And uh, they will all get their chance in the sun as well. But let's take a look at how the race finished. Results for the International Trophy for Classic G-Car. Results for the International Trophy for Classic GT cars here at Silverstone. The pre-66 encounter was won by Julian Thomas and Cameron, uh, Callum Lockie, who started from pole position. James Dodd driving solo in the end in the E-Type, led into the closing stages, but the Daytona Coupe just had too much. John Davison, Mike Whitaker, third and fourth for TVR, ahead of the Hancock and Spears, TVR Griffith and the Ward Kent E-Type, the second of the Jags home ahead of the Pearsons. Thorpe and Quake, Andrew Haddon winning his class in ninth place. Royal Deslades, uh, Cobra Daytona Coupe, just ahead of Richard Cook's Cobra. And a huge grid of cars. Again, almost no contact between any of them. And of our 65 starters, I think, Perhaps two or three didn't make it through to the chequered flag. Wherever they were, I'm sure it was a fantastic 50-minute race for all of our drivers and teams. Well, Jeremy Clarkson, himself a big car buff, of course, and a motor racing fan, chatting with Jonathan Gill, one of the men who's responsible for the promotion and PR of this event. And Clarkson here with the farm and uh, a whole host of other, a whole bunch of other ephemera. Clarkson's Farm, of course, returns. The Diddley Squat Farm returns to your TV screens this autumn. So uh, I'm sure Jeremy taking uh, a small hiatus from not getting the crops in correctly and mistreating <laughs> his handy animals in his uh, happy manner. Well, what a race we had. The biggest grid of the weekend so far. 65 starters in our pre-66 International GT race. International trophy being battled for by big V8 cars and small 1,602 litre racers alike. Whether it was power or lightness and clever thinking, it was entertainment all the way. Whatever you were driving, you were never alone for long. Julian Thomas led early on in the Daytona Coupe. And despite a longer pit stop because of their speed and power, he and Callum Lockie came through to chase down the leaders. After missing several other spins, the yellow Cobra, the hairy canary, had trouble of its own. But late in the race, Callum Lockie coming through in the Daytona Coupe to claim victory in the International Trophy.